Hello, welcome to our show. We are Business Love with Ryan. I am Ryan. Here we focus on what it takes to make your ideas happen and the steps you can follow to make it just a little bit easier. Subscribe to our podcast to join the ongoing conversation about all things startup business related. Find even more content on our YouTube channel, Ryan's Business Class. See the link in our description of this episode. So glad to have you here. Maybe we can learn something together. Enjoy. Hey, welcome to Business Love with Ryan. I am Ryan. This is our third ever podcast, and I just want to welcome everybody. Um, Today, what we're talking about is you know, the current business environment. It's the same thing we talked about last week. And we really just want to focus on some of the challenges that exist right now because all of this was unexpected, but somehow we must find a way to keep going. And at this podcast, what we really try to do is extract uh, specific business models or principles or um, uh, concepts and the key points and, you know, discuss what it would take to make a similar project Um, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, We are focused on helping people uh, create uh, whatever appeals to them. So right now we're in a situation where we can't have offices. We can't have a lot of face-to-face selling. We can't have uh, anything on the street, really. Uh, There's at least here in Ukraine, there's, a, there's an ordinance coming down tomorrow that you can't even be in public without a face mask now. All public transport uh, is uh, shut down. Uh, all offices, most restaurants, uh, most stores in general, pretty much the only things that are, are working is um, carry out food, uh, grocery stores, and um, perhaps banks. Just critical institutions still have people coming, but even they are experiencing very low uh, business because people are just staying home. Uh, The population is nervous. The population really wants to be careful. And so we ask ourselves, well, what does this mean for survival? You know, we have to survive. Uh, We still have dreams. We still have hopes. We would like to make certain realities happen for ourselves. And perhaps in the process of solving problems for ourselves, we can solve problems for other people as well you know, get ourselves back to normal at least. It's funny how much you appreciate the simple things that are now not so possible, like hanging out in the streets with your friends or sitting down at a cafe and talking with somebody. It's still possible. Most people will still sit down at a cafe, but it's more difficult to get them out of their house. People's habits have changed. People are truly concerned about their own uh, health and, you know, what it would mean for them. And I think it's scary a little bit. You know, if I get coronavirus. I don't know what my reaction will be. Probably I'll feel some discomfort. I'll feel a little bit tired. (sighs) Maybe I can't breathe quite so easily because the pneumonia uh, bacteria has started to grow in my lungs. It could be anything. But at least for the purpose of our subject matter here, we need to ask ourselves, what will the future of business be? What will the future of our businesses be or the businesses we wish to make? There's really just a few categories that most companies that exist right now will fall into. And, you know, there are the companies that will suffer from this uh, downturn, from this crisis, but they will eventually recover. Those would be companies that maybe don't have a lot of debt or they've managed their debt well because uh, during no business time, it's your debt that really destroys your business because you still have obligations. Uh, The bank is not going to be interested in making some sort of... um, a secondary arrangement. I suppose if the entire economy is somehow uh, in distress, then banks would do it at a sort of government level. But I think if you are a company and you owe the bank a large amount of money, let's say you have to pay them five, six, seven thousand dollars a month, and you don't have any business, they're still going to expect that payment. So that's what suffering is. Now, a well-run company will be able to recover from it. A well-run company that kept some cash on hand, that maybe had some insurance policies for something like this, um, has uh, structured their workforce to be remote. Uh, That's actually specifically what we want to talk about today, because a lot of companies, even without a crisis, would benefit from having a more remote workforce. But So recovery might be, for any company, 
and for most new companies and a, a certain eye on the use of remote workforces because there's advantages to doing it. It's a more fluid population. If you have to send everyone home from your company, most of them are not geared to sit at home and do their work. So that's going to be lost money. That's going to be lost productivity. You know, they sit at home and they watch TV and they can't get comfortable and there's no boss breathing down their neck. And so they're more likely to do 50% of the work. Whereas somebody who entered the job market with the consideration of being a remote worker knows who they are, knows what their strengths are, believes that they can thrive in a remote environment, uh, they're going to be more likely to do the job well and they're going to be easier to find. And if you have enough time as your, for your, uh, to look for them, it's nice to have maybe one of your staff units uh, to be remote. You know, maybe not all of your call center is remote, but maybe a third of it is. There's a branch or a block, or depending on how you view them or how your applications categorize them. Uh, I think the companies of the future are really, uh, are really, could really benefit from leaning more heavily on a remote workforce. So, you know, some companies will suffer and recover. Some, some companies will straight up die. A lot of the younger companies, a lot of companies that are uh, still in the growth process, if they get attacked by uh, an economy like this, uh, it's going to be hard to pick themselves up again. They already have debt, and the prospects of getting those early sales are much less likely than they ever have been prior. So now it's time to think about, okay, is it easier to set this business up again later? Um, So, you know, they could just tear it all down, stop paying rent you know, break the lease. There's a certain penalty for this, but it's less of a penalty than owing money. Uh, and then, you know, you, uh, take down your fixtures, your, you still have your branding, you still have your, uh, intellectual property, you still have your mission and your, you know, your company concept, you still have whatever assets you purchased before. Um, now you just don't have a centralized working location. So some companies need this. I mean, you can't have a restaurant without a centralized location. You can't have a beauty establishment without a centralized location. But software development, business consulting, uh, financial consulting, any sort of financial management, I don't see why you have to do it in a specific office. Advertising, traditionally done in a specific office. And that's because you can brainstorm together, you have resources together, you can talk about things quickly. And... It's still true, though, that as recently as, I don't know, 10 years ago, even even a little bit more perhaps, in some ways less, it's become very easy to work from home. Google Documents. Um, you can share any information you're doing. And so at any time, you can just uh, go on Viber or go on Facebook and send them a message. So it's the same truth. So why not? I think it's a little bit more comfortable for a leader especially if you're paying them salary to say, okay, I'm paying them this amount of money and they're going to be here doing this amount of hours and I'm with them and I'm watching them so they're going to be, they're going to be doing work. Some companies will die and then recover. Um, uh, cruises, airlines. Airlines will continue to be. As companies, they're suffering right now and a certain group of investors stand to lose a lot of money, but those airplanes can change hands. One investor sells out, licking their wounds, uh, crawling back in the darkness to recover, whereas other investors come in excited about a fresh economy that will spring forth from this whenever this uh, is gotten under control. Uh, So airplanes will go out of business, almost all of them. Those assets will be recovered by somebody else, and either new brand names or will form or new or old brand names will be revitalized under new management. This can be expected. It's not the end of the world. In some ways, it's, it's not going to make a difference at all because those planes are still going to be flying under somebody's flag. And so prices will probably stay the same, especially if you use a centralized forum like Expedia. It'll just be a different company name. You'll still see the same plane. It was American Airlines last week. This week, it's Southwest Airlines. Let's keep on going. So the purpose of all of this is really to say that we have a strategy now session 
in our strategy now session, we want to talk about what it means for leadership to manage a remote workforce. Last week, we talked about what it means to be a worker and to establish yourself as a freelancer. And there's advantages to doing that. Maybe you can choose what projects you get involved with. It's a more fluid environment where you can get in and get out. Uh, or you can be long term. You can contract as you wish and you know you can take whatever you find and work it in your own schedule as you see comfortable you can negotiate your terms that's really the uh the most difficult aspect about being a freelance worker who doesn't have a specific boss all the time or is committed to a company as a freelancer so you still keep your identity as your own company in a way What's difficult about that is you're almost certainly going to want to negotiate the terms of your work. You're going to want to say, this is what I believe that I'm worth. And there's no problem going a little bit too high. It's much better to say a little bit too much and have them counter with a more practical offer than to say too little and have them accept it immediately. And maybe you're a little bit better friends now because you made them a good deal, but you're working for less than you deserve. Uh, but that's, that's the hardest part. Now, as a boss, you have to be prepared for every employee you have coming in the door to be making different demands about salary and requirements. And you could say to them, no, no, this project has a uniform pay package for all people who work on it, and they'll have the choice to either accept it or not. But on some level, even if it's just a few statements, you are going to have to negotiate with each one of your workers. I suppose it's true in the hiring process, but it feels much more uh, visceral and relevant when uh, these people are still maintaining their business identity, their own business leadership identity, which is what you would expect from a remote workforce. I suppose there is some level where you could create a remote workforce of people who truly feel like they're uh, working for you, but I, I just think... It's time for a mutual respect relationship without unions. It's every man negotiate for himself. You don't even know who your other remote workers are, technically. They do the same job as you. Maybe you see them in the chat group, but you don't know. You don't know who they are, so you don't know if they're making more or less. Uh, as a leader, you would definitely want to make it a mandate not to discuss your pay package because different people have different uh, experiences and... Uh, different negotiating skills and they came at different times it, it, the list goes on there is going to be a disparity and that's just the sloppy way that life works but it's beautiful in a way because everyone gets to make their own decisions so i think we need to commit to the ideal of leading a remote workforce even if it wasn't a crisis right now one unit of your customer service or one unit of your transaction recording unit uh division or maybe one unit of your marketing uh, division, uh, a, a team or a small piece, try having them working remote because in times like this, they will keep on functioning at 100%. You don't got to scramble to reinvent that department now. Um, it might not be practical to have 100% of your department be remote or not remote at, any, at all times, but uh, a mix seems most practical because there, of course, like we said, there are advantages to having a centralized work location. And I'm not convinced yet that this has changed permanently. But uh, this situation lays bare the need to uh, balance uh, this configuration, balance some remote, some core, some core location. And in order to have a remote workforce, you're going to need to sort of de uh, develop an uh, employee interface. So your employees are going to need to interact with their job, with the company that they're responsible to, in the form of some application. Maybe it sort of functions like a, a profile and you kind of have your own even your own social media truth. You have your profile that people can see and you have an email through the company and there's maybe an internal uh, company messaging board, um, a, a memo board of some sort. And you can develop a workflow just with these basic tools. And uh, last night when me and our team here were discussing uh, what we were going to talk about today, it became very apparent that if you're going to talk about having a remote workforce, developing your own remote workforce. It really is important to understand 
uh, the the workflow of the of the company that you have. So obviously, if you have a company, you understand that the memos go to the sales department, and the sales department acts on those memos, and then they sc- scratch something off, and they send the same memo maybe to the next department, which would be. Um, a transaction recording for all new sales and uh, leads that didn't work. So you would maybe have an analysis process for all leads that just came out of the marketing department. Well, traditionally, that would have been an actual piece of paper that went from basket to basket as it was processed through the different departments. And that represented a funnel, so to speak. And it was actually a visible thing that was taking place. You could actually see the departments interacting with each other hand to hand. Now, of course, it's all online. It's easier than it's ever been. You can get weeks worth of such work done in minutes or even maybe a few hours. And so we're much more efficient. It's just all the technology is there for a remote workforce to begin leadership roles in business, in world business. You know, why should our employees not be on the beach somewhere? You can hire them as freelancers, so maybe they don't... Uh, uh, demand or require or uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for let's say demand for now they aren't aren't demanding certain benefits from you they're much less likely to unionize and so you have a and they're going to be a little bit more fickle that's how people are they're going to be much more likely just to cut ties at any given time so as a business leader you would want to keep a human resources pool of potential freelancers at all times Eventually, you would realize it that for this size of workforce, if I'm dealing with in, entirely of freelancers, I would need to have 20% uh, in waiting or on standby or in the interview training process at any given time because people are constantly going out the door, not as fast as they're coming in, hopefully, but sometimes it will be that way. Uh, so, there's other principles that become very apparent from this situation stemming from uh, or in uh, conjunction with remote workforce uh, management. And that would be, of course, distributed manufacturing, for instance. Why are we doing all of our manufacturing in China? It's the same principle that would, re- that would call you to have employees distributed in different locations and not coming to a centralized office. Why do you do that? So when the meteor strikes the earth... You still have some workers over here and you still have some workers over there and they're poised to continue working at 100%. However, in this situation, it's very much like we just have an office and all of our manufacturing is done in one location and we need to distribute that, we need to distribute that as well. It needs to be not only remote workforce but remote uh, production as well. Um, so then, honestly... Our relationship with China has become almost offensive. Not even almost. Like it is, it is an affront to goodness. It's an affront to uh, being an upstanding professional in your own to be dealing with a country that treats you this way. I've almost thought about starting a store that says, not made in China. That's the whole point of our store. I think if you want a challenge for me, if you want a commitment to me about what uh, the future of business should be as a result of this experience, I think everyone watching this should challenge them to go out and at least half of their purchases should be not made in China. Look at the tags. If it says made in China, don't buy it. It's time to stop doing business with them. It's time for the population to take a stand that says, you know what, this is unacceptable to me personally. Not just the way the world is, not just, uh, you know, everything is bigger than me and I just need to find my place. No, I think if each person said to themselves, no, I'm not going to do business with China anymore, that could become a trend. That could become something that, that makes a difference in the future. We should start a, hat- a hashtag, hashtag not made in China. How about that? Let's stop this insanity. We're driving a car at a brick wall. We are dealing with people with a completely different value system and they don't respect us. And I don't know. I can't imagine myself being part of creating the next generation and then handing them this, this, 
this uh, dysfunctional relationship as the norm, as the standard of uh, how we run a society. It's time to start downsizing them, distributing manufacturing, India, Brazil, uh, your own country, in United States, in Canada, in the uh, UK. Why should there not be some factories? I don't understand why uh, Russia, whose economy is faltering so bad, doesn't dive head first into actually competing with China. Why are they not uh, learning, you know, manufacturing clothing at least? This manufactures so many people. Clothing fall apart all the time. And so you, uh, there's a constant need for it. It's just one example. But I think... Dealing with uh, China the way we have been has to change in almost every single way. It's not just about trade war. It's not just about don't tax our goods or we'll tax your goods. It's, you know what? You need to be isolated. You need to not have anybody doing business with you. You know, let's see you uh, build your own world without the leadership of the West. Let's see it happen. It's not going to happen. And... This idea that we're so dependent and we have no choice and, um, oh, we don't want to spend a little bit more for products, so we might as well sell our soul to China. That's got to stop. And I don't know if they did this corona thing on purpose or if it was a big accident or if it was just a freak of nature, but the timing of it is so unbelievably coincidental. It's too much to believe. It's too much to accept. I think... All right, maybe somebody ate some meat exactly one year before the election, the re-election of their most staunch enemy. Yeah, let's let's assume that that happened, and that there's only a few such facilities in the world, but one of them is in Wuhan, China, and sickness has spilled out of it. So obviously, so remote workforce, do it. In the next section, we're going to talk about business supermodels, and what I want to focus on in that is. If you are a young person, a nobody with no company around you already, no credibility, and you want to start building a company, you have a good idea. And I think that there is an opportunity to go on Upwork and organize your entire operation through a series of back and, f- uh, back and forth messages with potential workers. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second, so uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> 